I do. I move furniture. <laughs> oh, golly. So, you're going to need this? Okay. Not till I'm done. <laughs> Our speaker today, I have to tell you that um, I knew about Doug long before I met him. He w he's kind of a legend, not only in his own mind, but in the world as well. <laughs> <laughs> and I always heard about this guy, Doug Craig, and out of Calgary. And so when I met him for the first time, I was so nervous, only to find out that he is who he is, which is a pretty tremendous, tr tremendous man. So let me tell you about him. He is currently retired, semi-retired. He served for 30 years over two, t I have my glasses on, that'll actually help. Two tenures as an instructor in the School of Business at SAIT in Calgary. He's still instructing part-time. He has been actively involved in the New Thought Movement, that's what we are, for over 40 years. He has spoken in over 70 New Thought Centers and churches. He was the founding minister of the Red Deer Center for Spiritual Living in 1990, excuse me, 1988, and served as its pastor for eight years. He served as an associate minister and member of the board of Joy of Life Center for Spiritual Living with Reverend Nadine Rogers for 12 years, and he is currently, yay, a member of our center here. In addition, he is also in demand as a professional Santa Claus. Really? <laughs> and for custom guided tour experiences in the Rocky Mountains. He is a genuine mountain man, having grown up in Canmore, Exshaw, and Banff areas, and has logged over 7,500 kilometers hiking in the past 23 years. He's the real deal. He is the real deal. So please welcome Reverend Doug Craig. Good morning. How's everybody this wonderful morning? It was a pretty bleak day 40 years ago in the second Sunday in 1980. At the age of 30, I walked through the doors, a slightly crippled man. And what Pat said about we accept anybody is true then as it is true now because I wasn't anybody. And uh, I immediately after a year being involved with the center was on the board of directors here for seven and a half years as a treasurer vice president and president, and we went through a transition uh, in 82, 83, and that's when we brought in Dr. Arlene Bump, who became the teacher and the minister and taught the first science of mind class in Canada to Canadian students and graduated Canadian ministers, who I was the first to start a center, and my colleague, Darlene Chase, Reverend, stand up, Darlene. In the back, we were <laughs> classmates. So you do know the quality of the support staff that you got here when you taught Reverend Darlene. So yeah, and, uh, and, and you've heard all of the story there. So what I wanna do is just give you a little bit of an idea of what I was up to the last year and just some of the photos there that I went through. Uh, I was a kickoff speaker at the Canadian New Thought Conference in uh, June in Edmonton. Oh, there we are. Mrs. Claus is here today. And by the way, we are 80% uh, booked with over 125 hours for next year already. <laughs> oh, oh, geez, I got excited there. It went too fast. There I am in the classroom wrapping up. I'm done in April for good. Whee! And there I am at uh, Sentinel Pass, 750 meter climb this summer to get there. Did a wedding, how do you like that for a view? 435 meters, 5.5 clicks on November 2nd. Little tacky, you see I was dressed casually. <laughs> 
real reindeer we had, folks. Are those stuffed? No, they're real. And there's Santa in the classroom, one of my favorite places. There we are. And one of the great weddings I did, those three gentlemen and the chief usher, usher are Afghanistan war vets of the Canadian Army. So I had the honor of being with those folks and doing them. Uh, that's actually my first ex-wife's nephew. She wasn't invited, but I was. <laughs> okay. And here's Santa before. Uh, also, you probably wonder, did I, I look like this all my career? Absolutely not. Uh, this has been the last seven or eight years. I get a little older. Uh, 1993, there's uh, Reverend Doug being ordained, and that's Dr. Arlene Bump, Reverend Lloyd Klein in the background there. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. And that's what I looked like. I honestly looked like that. <laughs> Okay, and I'm going to show you a few more pictures here. Uh, this is what I call before the center. I'm not going to comment on it. A picture's worth a thousand words. The big guy in the back. Yeehaw! So anyhow, that's that. So today, what I want to talk about is the three most important things that I consider I learned in 40 years, which I all encourage you to take into consideration and develop and each one is to have and or develop and then the big word is use have and or develop and use a practitioner and a counselor have and develop and use your spiritual toolkit i'll give you a couple of examples but that's what i'm going to talk about and expand this afternoon on is what some of my tools and my kit are and to have and or develop and use your faith all three are extremely important so just let me go i think this is a blank here whoop yeah okay so uh have and or develop and use a practitioner and a counselor a practitioner the difference between the two is for me a practitioner is there to do spiritual counsel on specific requests from the client, to ask questions to help the client get clear on what we're working with at cause and to do a treatment for that. And we got a fine core of practitioners here. All the ministers are practitioners. And I'm starting to get to know the practitioner core. Uh, I've got to know Lance quite a bit, and I got to tell you, you got a character here called Ron Hahn that does the group on Mondays. Now, I'm not usually here much on Sundays because I got 27 guest speaking experiences already booked this year, but I do come Monday uh, and uh, participate in the class with Ron Hahn, one of the most interesting minds I've run across in 40 years. Great. I love being there. I encourage you to come, and we have some great times there. And, and so that's your practitioner to deal with specifics. Now here we're very fortunate because we got good ministers that are good counselors. But one needs both. If you think that after 40 years, I don't need a counselor or I don't need a practitioner, wrong. Because every now and again, I get into something that I need help with. Just happened last summer. Called my practitioner, got treatment. Called my counselor, got perspective. But it's very important. I remember the first time in my ministry was 89, 90, in that area. And uh, I, I didn't like the idea of having to do funerals. You know what, it's the job, but that's the part that... <sighs> so I had done one, and it wasn't really good. Then I gets the call, my best friend. Call me Slim. That was my AKA. I need help. What happened, Shri? What happened? Jason got murdered. His son, 20 years old. I've known him all his life. He did not know what to do. He wanted me to come down to organize things and then to conduct the memorial. Well, I'm beside myself. What do you do? There's nothing in ministerial school that says that. The only thing in ministerial school you get that helps you prepare for it is treatment. And I got to tell you, treatment works. I knew what I needed to do for the process, but I needed extra work. So I called, who happened to be my counselor and practitioner at the time, Dr. Arlene, because I needed help. I was in a rage. I was angry. I was upset. I didn't, I was helpless. I didn't know what to do. 
except to call a practitioner, call to get clarity. She brought me back, did treatment for me, I did my treatment. I went down in to do the uh, limit first preview, the uh, interview, and there were a lot of real heavy duty guys there because Ken was a very popular mechanic, one of the best in Western Canada, and there were a lot of angry guys who were ready to take up arms. And of course, I'm the preacher, I walk in and they're not happy with God, so guess who gets all of that? <laughs> it was really tense. So I, hey, then I go and did my thing and got everything organized and I went back. And man, I never did so much treatment in, in my life. And I got Arlene involved again and got it. And then I went. And then you, when you do treatment, you have to do it and understand that it works. So that means walking into the consciousness and just doing it. Because the spirit never lets you down. Long as you could keep the channel clear. So I conducted that memorial, and because of what I saw happen, I realized that that is one of the most valuable services that I can perform and help people in their time of need. And at the end of the day, I had the lineup going by, and I had these big, tough guys walking by me, and they had tears in their eyes, and they grabbed my hand, same guys that did the God thing to me, and they shook my hand, and they said, I don't know what happened, but I want you to know I'm okay. Got it? And there was no violence that happened because of that. Everybody walked away complete. And I go, thank you, God. What a revelation that was for me to be able to step into that consciousness that was established and to be able to be a facilitator to be able to bring some kind of healing through that tragedy to the people that were there. So, you know, always get to. When I went on my journey, I, I had that addiction saying, you know, anybody ever here do addictions? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I've done them all. And so I ended up with two years counseling to deal with that through my eating disorders, because you'll see when I, I show you a few more pics up here, that, uh, well, you see the pic there of the 93. Uh, I weighed 425 pounds when I went to Red Deer. Another story, maybe later today. Okay, so counsel and a practitioner. I only talk about what I use. I don't talk about what people, I think people should do. I only talk about what I do. Here we go. Next thing. You got to have and or develop and use your spiritual toolkit. The one thing that I run across in the Science of Mind textbook on page 282 and 283 when I got it as a gift in the Christmas of 1980, a year later, and I found it, threw it against the wall to go through three textbooks, and I always went back to it, because this is the truth. Stay with the one and never deviate from it. Never leave it for a moment. Nothing else can equal this attitude. To desert the truth in our hour of need is to prove that we do not know the truth. Oh, I hated that. Whap against the wall. Okay, back into the truth. When things look the worst, that is the supreme moment to demonstrate to ourselves that there are no obstructions to the operation of truth. When things look the worst, that is the best time, the most satisfying time. The person who can throw himself with complete abandon into that limitless sea of receptivity, having cut loose from all apparent moorings, is the one who will always create the greatest rewards. True, you saw my rewards. They didn't come easy, but they did come that way. Have and develop and use your spiritual toolkit. Use. So I got a lot of things in my toolkit that Ann and I use, in particular, our three no's. No justifying, no blaming, and no attachment to outcomes. We work that every day. We talk about it all the time. Man, and we use our spiritual toolkit, so a lot of that's going to be later. I'm going to talk about one of my most favorite areas, and that's learning how spirit speaks to me 
through circumstances and situations, how I am guided, directed, and led. It could be the voice. It could be a dream. It could be an unusual thought at an unusual time. It could be resistance to something. And definitely, I have a reaction. I got a problem. It doesn't matter what I do with it. Okay? So there's all of those, but one of my most favorite ones, and the most favorite one, is the prompt. So sometimes you have to have total faith and total trust and remain clear, keep the channel clear, and follow the prompts. And I got to tell you, I'm going to share a story that had I been told what to do, I would never have done it. Absolutely not. Absurd. But true story, and I got two stories I'm going to tell, this one and one with my last point, and, and there's another person involved. You ever, ever wonder how somebody else experienced one of the stories that you're told up here? <laughs> yeah. Well, in both cases, I got my buddy Tony. He was both in those circumstances, just him and me. Tony, where are you? Stand up. At the end of the day, there's Tony. You can ask him how he experienced what I'm going to share with you. Following the spiritual prompts, Tony and I were teaching for Saint in a medium-sized Chinese city of 14.5 million <laughs> called Shenyan in 2001. We were the first two to go over. We're teaching there. Chinese people were really good. Because we're on the school budget, we didn't get where all the whiteies were put. We got uh, our aliens or whatever you want to call us. We were put with the Chinese. So we got quite an interesting experience. Uh, people were really good. However, after 75 days, Tony and I are walking home one day, throngs of people on the street, stopped across the street at the lights, and we were surrounded by a gang of thugs. There's 11 of them. 10 of them, they got a ring around us, and the thug, the top thug, I think, is, I figured that, he's in the middle, and he squares off against me, because you'll see I'm bigger than Tony. And so I'm going, okay, this is my mind. You saw the pictures. Plan B... I know what I'm going to do. I know the first three. I know how I'm going to do it. Doug's plan. But I made a commitment in 1980 to move from a life checkered of violence into nonviolence. So I said, okay, plan A, God, you're on. <laughs> and, and again, folks, you know, you have to learn to park your fear and to park your stuff and to stay calm, confident, and clear. You might say, oh, it's pretty hard. Well, I had lots of practice <laughs> on the journey. 40 years gives you lots of practice. So I just followed what was done. And, and by the way, folks, I never, ever thought about this before, and I can't believe I did it, but I did. So I, I gets down, and I starts getting down on the same level as the guy. And he's staring me, I'm staring him. I get the dirty on. I know how to do the dirty. <laughs> and then we're just doing this. Seemed like hours, and then... I started moving like this. You can ask Tony, slowly like this. <laughs> We're like this, eye to eye, face to face, hands down, waiting for the next move. And it was, ah, 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 and I snapped on, I think I got him on the cheek. And all 11 of them ran. <laughs> right, Tony, they just ran. Woof. I think they thought I was crazy. I don't care what they thought. <laughs> Do I care? When you follow spiritual prompts, folks, you got to know that that had to be God because I already had a way better plan than that to take the first three guys out. I know how to work on 5.5 .5 to 1. I've done it before. Never have I done anything like that. Honest to God, they just ran. And I said to Tony, I thought it turned out better than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do? And it's, it's that following of the spiritual prompts. It's that faith that's so rich for us, which is to have and develop and use your spiritual... Well, that's not it. That's I just did that. It's to have and develop and use your faith. Faith saves lives. It saved mine for the medical disaster in Italy with Anna, and it saved other people's lives that I've been bald. I'm not talking about, oh, we made a changes. I'm talking about life right there. Put yourself in this scenario. 
Tony and I are out going for a walk. We're at Ribbon Creek, 2014, the year after the flood. We're going to check out our favorite trail. This side, you could go up to where they're working. Down there's a disaster code. Nobody's allowed. <laughs> Starting to see this. <laughs> On the way up, Tony's complaining he's got acid reflux, well, which is nothing unusual. Gets tense. He's been getting that. And started to get some bronchial problems. And Tony's been known to have bronchial problems. We didn't think nothing of it. We got up to the point where, no, you don't go here. And we went. But 1.1 click down there, all of a sudden Tony collapses on the ground. He's got tears that I've never seen him with tears. He's got pain, he can hardly breathe, and he's worried that he's going to die. Which, when you hear the story, is quite logical. And so, you know, I'm not a medical guy. I don't know too much about it. I don't know how to take people out but not bring them back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> only thing I know is treatment. And to know that you cannot afford the luxury of a negative thought when the crap hits the fan. You've got to be clear. I had to be clear for him. He doesn't know what I'm doing, but I'm doing treatment inside. He has to listen to me for three solid hours. I never shut up because I wanted to make sure his head was in the right place. We'd make a goal, do it, have a rest. Make a goal, do it, have a rest. Three hours. We get to one place, there's an 800-meter hill. Do the treatment. Tony says, God, I can breathe. The pain's going away. Up the hill, woof, it's back again. Get him down to the parking lot, get him into the foot. Go in the next day, I was greeted by the cardiology team. The head guy, dozen other interns and all that. And Tony said, that's the guy. And the head guy looked at me and says, you didn't carry him, did you? No. He says, how did you get him out? I said, it was the power of spiritual and mental resolve. And the willingness to stand in the eye of the storm. I am calm. I am centered. I am peaceful. I am poised at all times and all situations. That is the demonstration of faith. I followed the prompts. I followed the guides. I got him to the hospital one year or less a day than when I went. Same hospital. And Tony had a 90% blockage in one of his arteries. They don't know why he's alive. On paper, he's a dead man. But we know the truth. Tony knows a little bit more about this than now than he did it that day. <laughs> so those are the three things that I'm going to expand upon now, uh, <clears throat> or this afternoon. Dr. Holmes said, faith is a mental attitude which is so convinced of its own idea, which so completely accepts it, that any contradiction is unthinkable and impossible. So learn to walk and demonstrate that you have the faith. And you'd be surprised what the Spirit gives you to be able to take you to the next level. So I'm going to close here with a story. A uh, little slide here. When thinking about life, remember this. No amount of guilt can change the past. And no amount of anxiety can change the future. So I'm going to close with the power of unconditional love. My version, not the textbook versions, uh, not our textbook, but the definitions in the dictionary and everything. It's separating a person from the problem. You love the person, but you've got to have boundaries and limits and deal with the problem and not be part of the problem. Hard to do. It can make a difference in a man's life or death. My mother was like that. In December, or March of 1983, I gave my first talk in the podium, and that was here at our center. It was called Love, Life, Hope, and a Touch of the Master's Hand. And I had my mom and dad there. And I talked about unconditional love, and I'm going to share the story, read the poem I closed with, and Amy's going to come up, and the band are going to close with a song. So here's the story. July 1982. 
I woke slumped over a table in a dark kitchen, a drug house, paraphernalia, needles and everything all over the place, no one's around, I'm there. And I looked at my arms and the needle tracks on my arms and my hands and my ankles, and I become disgusted with myself because I had become what I had despised. I had become what was unacceptable with the bros and the gang. I had become what was unacceptable for my family, my friends, and for me. I had become what I had despised. And you know, I remember that because it was a defining moment in my life. This is why unconditional love is important, and it may work. I, in that darkness, decided that the best thing I could do, I went through the whole process, rationalization, was just end it all because of what I had become. And I was very clear on it. I was convinced that that was what needed to be done to move forward. And I mixed up an overdose, and something happened that I could not explain for many years. I was going to do it, but this voice said, but your mother loves you. And I couldn't do it. And this poem represents how I was and how I felt on that day. It's called The Touch of the Master's Hand. It's me. T'was battered and scarred in the auctioneer, thought it scarcely worth as well, to waste much time on the old violin, but he held it up with a smile. What am I bidding, good folks, who'll start the bidding for me? A dollar, a dollar, then two, only two, two dollars, who'll make it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice, going for three, but no, from the room far back, a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow. Then wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening the lo loosened strings, he played a melody pure and sweet as a caroling angel sings. The music ceased, and the auctioneer, with a voice, voice that was quiet and low, said, what am I bid for the old violin? And he held it up with the bow. A thousand dollars, who make it two thousand? And who make it three? Three thousand once, three thousand twice. And going and gone, cried he. The people cheered, but some of them cried. We do not quite understand what changed his worth, its worth. Swift came the reply. It was the touch of the master's hand. And many a man with light out, of, light out of tune and battered and scarred with sin is auctioned cheap to a thoughtless crowd, much like the old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He's going once, and he's going twice. He's going and almost gone. But the master comes, and the foolish crowd can never quite understand the worth of a soul. And the change is wrought by the touch of the master's hand. There's a calm surrender to the rush of day. Turn. 